The Vicki Morgan scandal was nearly the Jeffrey Epstein scandal of the 1980s. It was dubbed Reagan-gate, and it was so explosive it almost brought down the Reagan administration. The course of the 1980s was nearly changed by this one prostitute who knew a whole lot of secrets. Vicki Morgan's story is one of those classic, all-American tales that just warms your heart. Actually, not really. She moved to Los Angeles at 17 to become a movie star and instead got addicted to hardcore drugs and became a prostitute. This was in the early 1970s, and around this time she met a man named Alfred Bloomingdale. Bloomingdale was a very rich man who was from the family that founded Bloomingdale's department store chain. He was also friends with Ronald Reagan, who was governor of California at the time, and Bloomingdale's wife Betsy was Nancy Reagan's best friend. Bloomingdale was a key member of what was called Ronald Reagan's Kitchen Cabinet, which was a group of millionaires who funded his run for California governor and later his run for presidency. Now the part that interests us is that Alfred Bloomingdale loved prostitutes. He owned what was described as a sex dungeon where him and his political buddies would have sex parties with prostitutes. And if you look at this guy, he just kind of looks like the type of dude who would have a sex dungeon in his basement, doesn't he? I don't know, maybe that's just me. But for over a decade, Vicki Morgan served as Alfred Bloomingdale's mistress and participated in sex parties and orgies with him and his political buddies. But then in 1982, Bloomingdale died. Up to his death, he'd paid Vicki Morgan $10,000 a month for her services. Now that he was dead, that money was gone, and Vicki Morgan quickly went broke. So she sued Alfred Bloomingdale's estate for palimony. And during her deposition, she started revealing details about what happened in Bloomingdale's sex dungeon. And when this information was made public, it went off like a bomb. People speculated about which of Bloomingdale's friends were involved, and it was really the talk of the nation for a while. But Vicki Morgan lost her lawsuit, so she decided to write a tell-all book. She said the information in her book was so explosive, it would make Watergate look like play school. But then something happened in July 1983 that kind of derailed her tell-all book. Vicki Morgan had her head bashed in with a baseball bat. Her roommate Marvin Pankos was arrested for her murder. It was claimed that Pankos had a history of mental illness and, how convenient, he'd snapped and decided to bludgeon her to death at the precise moment she was about to write her tell-all book. Marvin Pankos claimed he was innocent, and there are a ton of questions about his guilt, which we'll get to a little later on in the video. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't kill him. Marvin Pancoast, is he a madman, a spinner of fantasy, or the fall guy in a murder involving government intrigue, as his attorneys have claimed all along? So Vicki Morgan died, Marvin Pancoast was arrested for her murder, and that's the end of the story, right? Not quite. Because it turned out that Alfred Bloomingdale had rigged his sex dungeon with hidden cameras, and everything that had gone on in there had been taped. It was rumored that Vicki Morgan possessed some of the tapes showing very prominent politicians in the Reagan administration in Bloomingdale's sex dungeon, and that's why she was killed. Marvin Pankos claimed he'd seen the tapes Vicki possessed, and he described them. Vicki and a couple of uh, politicians in your, uh, I don't know where it was filmed at. I wasn't around when it was done. You saw it? Mm-hmm. And then things started getting weird. A few days after her death, Marvin Pankos lawyer Robert Steinberg called a press conference. He announced that a mysterious unidentified woman had dropped off a duffel bag containing three video cassette tapes at his office. Steinberg said the tapes showed prominent government officials in the Reagan administration engaged in very kinky, obscene sex acts with Vicki Morgan. And he was given the tapes to help prove Pankos had been framed for Vicki Morgan's murder. Now this was massive, massive news when it was announced. But this bombshell was reduced to ashes the very next day. Steinberg announced that, unbelievably, the tapes had been stolen from his office during his press conference the day before. The Vicki Morgan tapes were now missing, and no one knew what happened to them. And after this, the whole Vicki Morgan tape scandal just basically turned into one big circus. Johnny Carson told jokes about it every night. Saturday Night Live did skits spoofing it. But the scandal was far from over. Because Larry Flint entered the picture. Flint claimed he had paid millions of dollars to an unidentified source for the Vicki Morgan tapes. He now owned the Vicki Morgan tapes and he was going to release them to the public. Flint was known for the men's magazine Hustler, but he actually had a magazine empire at the time with close to 100 publications. 
In The Rebel, which was an investigative magazine focused on exposing corruption and conspiracies, he published multiple massive articles about the Vicki Morgan tapes and he even featured President Reagan's picture on the magazine's cover. The rumors were that Flint paid $20 million for the Vicki Morgan tapes and he was going to use them to bring down the Reagan administration. He even called a press conference and played the tapes for a group of reporters. This article in the San Francisco Bay Guardian describes what they saw. Flint played a portion of one tape for the skeptical reporters. The black and white video showed a dead ringer for President Ronald Reagan, sans clothing, engaging in a bizarre sex act with a young woman wearing a dildo. The reporters were intrigued, but none wanted to touch the story. They left all the remaining food for the hotel employees to devour. And then right around this time, Larry Flint's life was basically destroyed. He claimed the government was trying to kill him, and he basically barricaded himself in his mansion and never left the house. Now, if you knew that the President of the United States had committed murder and you could prove it, and the FBI and the CIA works for him, would you leave your house? His wife contracted AIDS around this time, and there were rumors that she was injected with it as punishment. She turned into a shell of her former self and died shortly after by supposedly drowning in a bathtub. The Rebel suddenly stopped publishing, and the entire staff was fired. Despite its popularity, the magazine didn't even last a year. Right after that, Larry Flint was arrested and sentenced to 15 months in prison. And then the Vicki Morgan tape scandal just kind of vanished. The actual tapes never surfaced, and the whole issue was kind of just swept under the rug. Marvin Pankos was found guilty of her murder, and he later died in prison. And if you look into his case, it really appears that this poor guy was set up and totally railroaded for this murder. The official story is that Panko showed up to the North Hollywood police station at 3 in the morning on July 7, 1983, and he said, I just killed someone. Officers went to the apartment he shared with Vicki Morgan, found her body, and arrested him. But then he took back that confession shortly after he gave it and claimed he was innocent. His fingerprints weren't on the baseball bat used to kill Vicki Morgan. And even though the crime scene was a bloody mess, when Panko showed up to the police station right after the murder, he had no blood on him at all. There was literally zero physical evidence linking Marvin Pankos to Vicki Morgan's murder. And experts at the time noted that Marvin Pankos might be the first person ever convicted of murder with no physical evidence whatsoever tying him to that crime. During the trial, Pankos' lawyers claimed he was drugged out of his mind and hypnotized into confessing to the murder by unknown assailants. These people murdered Vicki Morgan, drugged and hypnotized Pankos into confessing to the crime, then stole the sex tapes she possessed. At the police station, officers noted how disoriented and confused Pankos was. The confession he gave was a rambling mess that covered nearly 10 pages, and it contradicted itself multiple times. Now, some might think that the idea of hypnotizing someone into confessing to a crime they didn't commit might sound a little out there, but it really might not be all that far-fetched. Just do a quick search online, and you're going to find a ton of videos and articles about people being hypnotized. If you've undergone the right training, it's apparently pretty easy to hypnotize someone. Take a nice deep breath. And it's especially easy to hypnotize someone if you're able to use drugs to relax them or put them in a confused state. During the trial, Pankos claimed the only thing he remembered about that night was watching Johnny Carson with Vicki Morgan and falling asleep around midnight. He then awoke a few hours later feeling disoriented and nauseous. He said the apartment smelled like medicine or chloroform, and the next thing he knew, he was at the police station with no idea how he'd gotten there. He told the desk clerk, I just killed someone, but he had no idea why he'd said that, and he didn't remember anything about his 10-page confession that night. Now, another question that was never answered about that night was, how did Marvin Pankos get to the North Hollywood police station from his apartment after the murder? Pankos' car was still parked at the apartment, and police couldn't determine how he'd arrived at the police station. The apartment that Pankos and Morgan shared was three miles from the North Hollywood police station, and Pankos showed up around 3 in the morning. When a pathologist examined Vicki Morgan's body at 8 a.m., he estimated her time of death at four hours earlier at 4 a.m. And this is just a bit of a slight problem, because Marvin Panko showed up to the police station and said, I just killed someone at 3 a.m., which is a full hour before her estimated time of death. Even if the pathologist's time of death is off by an hour or even two, there's still no way that Marvin Pankos could kill Vicky Morgan, wipe his prints off the baseball bat, clean up, change his clothes, get rid of his bloody clothes, and walk the three miles to the police station. This has led to speculation that someone drove Marvin Pankos to the police station that night, and many people believe it was the same person or people who murdered Vicky Morgan and then drugged and hypnotized Pankos. 
Author Gordon Bachichis, who Vicki Morgan was working with on her explosive biography, testified in court that, on the night before her murder, Vicki had told him she was afraid of being killed. Vicki had confided in me that she was afraid of being murdered, Bassichus said. I have a feeling that someone with knowledge of the Bloomingdale tapes approached her with a proposal for blackmail. And as the saying goes, if you mess with the bull, you get the horns. Vicki Morgan tried to blackmail some very powerful people, and it backfired in a big way and resulted in her murder. In a jailhouse interview, Marvin Pankos talked about how terrified Vicki Morgan was before her death. She was petrified of the administration and petrified of one particular gentleman in the administration, not the president. It's also interesting to note that the Vicki Morgan crime scene was not sealed by the LAPD until 24 hours after her death. It's basically unheard of to leave a murder scene unsealed for over a day after a crime. During that time, anyone could have wandered into the apartment and taken the Bloomingdale tapes she possessed, or tampered with the evidence at the crime scene. Ultimately, Marvin Panko's lawyer's efforts to convince the jury that there was more to the story failed. He was found guilty and died in prison. The Vicki Morgan tapes never surfaced, and this massive, massive controversy that really could have altered the course of the 1980s has been mostly forgotten with time.